Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and in some instances, saying that a Jew is a doctor is a redundancy. My son, the doctor, a redundancy. The truth is that in the Jewish tradition, nothing is more important than one's health and life. And the Jewish people have always had a reverence for men and women who have devoted their lives to healing and to medicine. And so on this edition of L'Chaim, I am so honored to be sitting with a giant in the field of medicine and healing in the state of Israel. Dr. Jonathan Halevi, Yonatan, who for more than 25 years now has served as the Director General of one of the premier hospitals of Israel, the Sharet Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. Under Dr. Halevi's direction, Sharet Tzedek has become the fastest growing hospital in Jerusalem and one of the largest medical facilities in all of Israel, including its Jesselson Heart Center, which enjoys an outstanding international reputation. And Dr. Halevi is the chairman of the Israel Health Basket Committee, which determines which drugs and medical procedures and technologies will be approved and subsidized by Israel's national health care system. Dr. Halevi is also a professor of medicine and has been on the faculties of Ben-Gurion University and Hebrew University. And Professor Levy, Halevi has an honorary doctorate from Yeshiva University. And he lectures extensively throughout Israel and the United States on crucial medical issues such as ethical dilemmas in medicine or patients' bill of rights and on how Israel responds to mass casualty events. And in full disclosure, it was a year ago exactly this week that I had the extraordinary good fortune to be cared for by a number of outstanding physicians at Sherry Tzedek Medical Center in Israel. And during my stay, I had the great pleasure and honor of meeting and getting to know a truly remarkable human being and one of the loveliest people I've ever had the privilege of knowing Dr. Jonathan Halevi, and it is so wonderful to have you sitting at this table for all sorts of reasons, but welcome, Baruch Abba, thank you so much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Well, you've done extraordinary work more than 25 years as director of Shari Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. So what was it, Yonatan, that drew you into a life of medicine? Well, I'm the first physician in my family, although there are many more now, so I did not inherit it. We know that this profession runs in families, in medical schools, although there is no protection, there is no preference for children of doctors, but we see, I see it on the admission committee, a few, a couple of medical schools, and you see that a large percentage of the candidates are children of physicians. Yes. So I think most of us lead life that is difficult mm -hmm. physically, but mm -hmm. very inspiring to the next generation. So the special, you say you're an internist. Yeah. And that's the direction in which you moved. How many years did you practice medicine in Israel before adding administration? Well, I'm still practicing, I'm practicing till this very day. I was the acting uh, chief of one of the departments of internal medicine. There were five at that time in Rabin's Medical Center. As I said, it was not Rabin at that time, 26 years ago, it was Bellinson. And that's when I got the proposal from the board of Sharet Tzedek. Actually, you mentioned the Jesson Heart Center. Uh, the late Mr. Ludwig Jesson was the chairman of our board at I that see. time. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was looking for someone to fill the position. There was severe managerial crisis at Sharet Tzedek at that time in the mid-80s, something similar to the crisis that Hadassah Hospital is undergoing now. And he was looking for a relatively young, I was 39 years old, with some administrative um, 
experience which I had from running mm -hmm. a medical service and mm -hmm. from my position in the army. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was recommended by the, the then Director General of the General Sick Fund, Kupat Cholim Kralit, who owned Bellinson. He interviewed me and the rest is history. Okay. So now I want to talk about issues that are interesting to me and then I want to talk about Shari Tzedek itself. Because the opportunity to speak to someone with your experience who has both been in medicine as a clinician as well as an administrator is a rare opportunity for any of us to, to be able to sort of pick your brains. In America, of course, the entire notion of universal health care has been at the forefront not only of the Obama administration, but as a result, it's been on the forefront of, of many American, uh, many Americans are, are, are aware of how important an issue it is and how one looks at the, the interchange between society as a whole and the specific problems of healing and medicine and the economics that go with it are of a crucial nature to how any society goes forward. I want to know from your perspective, and it, it would also be helpful for our audience to hear, what is Israel's perspective on the issue of health care being a basic civil right of any citizen? To what extent is Israel as a country and you as an individual committed to a notion that one of the things a society must provide its citizens by right of citizenship is access to medical care in a way that can be affordable? Well, I think uh, Israel is one of the leaders in the world in promoting this basic right of every human being. I would like to remind you that the first Kupat Cholim, General Sick Fund, that was based on the, on the principle that you pay for health care according to your financial ability, but you get health care according to your needs, it was founded in 1912, mm -hmm. long before the declaration of statehood. Mm -hmm. Now, for Americans today, it's easier to understand, but 30 years ago, when I was a fellow at Yale University, no one could understand. I mean, yes. people would look at Israel, you have socialized medicine there, we have fee for service. I want to tell you, when I came back after two years at Yale, I told my fellow Israelis that uh, it's wonderful to be a physician in the U.S., but it's wonderful to be a patient in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I think that this sentence really reflects the difference between socialized medicine that for years was considered infamous in this country. That is correct. Yeah, and I think till this very day, if you talk to the American Medical Association or to many physicians, they cannot even understand. You're absolutely right. It is not still, understand it is not, how, right. how, can you, how can you function uh, as a physician not on a basis of fee for service. Yes. And uh, it's very difficult for them to understand uh, universal coverage. And some of my best friends would not, until recently, accept Medicare patients, which is inconceivable to me. Mm -hmm. So yes, in Israel we have socialized medicine. We have also private medicine. Uh, some people say that we are moving towards privatization while you Americans are moving towards socialization and we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Do you think it's accurate? But, well, it's inaccurate. I, I want to tell you the following. As an Israeli, I am extremely proud that we have not only universal coverage. This we had, as I said before, long before the declaration of statehood. But since January 1st, 1995, we have a national insurance health law mm -hmm. by which every citizen, regardless of his origin, race, could be a new immigrant who was naturalized in Ben-Gurion Airport according to the law of return, or an Arab citizen that resides in East Jerusalem and do not vote under the direction of his leaders for the Jerusalem municipality, he will still have universal coverage, the same basket of services that everyone is entitled to. And all this in return for 4.8% of the gross salary of every employee up to a certain ceiling. The ceiling is seven times the average salary in the Israeli market. In other words, if you make $100,000 a month or 100,000 shekels a month, you will pay the same 
which is 4.8% of around 40,000 shekels. And the government asked from its own budget. And the basket of services that every citizen is entitled to is very impressive. We are not talking only about universal coverage. You are talking about a very wide basket of services. To give you an idea, Please. Israel always promoted large families. In the medical field of infertility, any couple who suffers from infertility problem is entitled to two children from public funding. I'm talking about two children. I'm not talking about two cycles of in vitro. You can try time and again until you have a child. And the basket of services is very wide. But when you read Israeli media, when uh, you talk to people, I think most Israelis do not understand how privileged they are mm -hmm. to be beneficiaries of A, universal coverage, B, such a wide basket of services. It's true that medicine becomes more and more costly. Yes. And no country in the world can supply from public funding its citizen with everything that modern medicine has to offer. It's very prominent in this country and even in Israel. But as chairman for the last two years of the updating, the committee that updates the basket of services, I can tell you that with all these new biological agents in oncology that are extremely expensive, we usually do not deal with first-line treatment, any life-saving medication. Any medication that prolongs life of quality significantly is long time ago in the basket and will be automatically in the basket every year if there is a new medication that abides by this criteria, life-saving or prolonging life significantly, not weeks, but more than months with good quality. In the basket committee, we are discussing third and fourth line treatments of cancer or medications that are still looking for the right place in modern medicine. We are looking at the evidence, at the efficacy and the side mm -hmm. effects of mm -hmm. medications. So all in all, I think that the national health insurance law of Israel that the Obamacare is trying to follow is A, really respecting the basic right of every citizen for health, B, we are doing it big time. Now, there are problems, and the problems are that many Israelis hold supplementary insurance because this national health insurance that really guarantees access to care and medications free of charge, still, if you want to choose your physician, if you mm -hmm. want to choose your surgeon, you have to add either out of pocket or buy supplementary insurance. And close to 80% of uh, Israeli citizens hold supplementary insurance for a nominal fee. Usually they pay to the sick funds, but the gap between what the public basket can guarantee and the expectations yes. of the public are widening every year, and we are always open to reforms. The current mm -hmm. Ministry of Health uh, Mrs. Yael German just chaired the committee uh, to upgrade the public services in Israel, and they submitted their conclusions to the government only last week. So it's a very dynamic field in Israel. But going back to your basic question, I think Israeli society, probably more than any other society in the Western world, have full understanding of this basic right to health, and the practical interpretation is very wide. And I think that uh, every Israeli citizen should be very proud okay, it to is, be a beneficiary of this. It is beautiful census. the way you describe it. I want to ask you some questions to understand if there are problems inside it or not. And again, these are the things that are heard all the time on the American scene. Number one, you alluded to it, but I want you to talk for a moment, in a moment, about cost. I want to understand how in the world does Israel afford to do what you've described. And then I want to know two things. I'm going to tell you a story. Um, all of us, it, uh, there's almost nobody I know who at some point in his life does not have a medical issue. So it's just part of what being a human being is. And I've had my issues. I consider myself to be extraordinarily lucky. People say to me, oh, you've had this, you've had this, you've had this. Yeah, but the reality is many of the things that I have, I would have been dead a long time ago, except I live in a different age where the world of medicine, 
the knowledge of physicians and the techniques, the equipment, and the medications are extraordinary. And many of us are living long, happy, productive lives in ways that our parents and grandparents never did. And, you know, Yonatan, I, I'm a practicing rabbi as well. I have members of my congregation of all ages. But what older people means today has nothing to do with what older people meant before. 60 is not 60, 70 isn't 70, 80 isn't 80. It's amazing to me how active and full people are into their 90s. It's extraordinary. Okay. Um, but I want to tell you this story. I'm in England, and they have a form of socialized medicine. And I have an issue. Minor, it turns out to be nothing. But I end up in an emergency room in London. And I have, myth, I have with me at all times my medication list. And I showed the, the doctor, I don't, know, I don't know what they call him, an internist or whatever they call him. I, I, I showed the doctor my medication list that I take every single day. He looks at the list and he says to me, if you were in England, you'd be dead a long time ago. We don't give this out for free. He meant if I was on socialized medicine. The kind of medication I was getting as, a, as an American in, in the system before Obamacare, he said to me, "Never, we just don't do this for people on a regular basis, what you've got here. And I want to know how that translates into the Israeli model. I want to know to what extent does the ordinary person get superb care at a critical stage, but to what extent day-to-day -day, a person who is going to be healthy with a certain kind of regimen, medication, etc., does that exist in Israel? And the secondary question is, how long do I have to wait? What I hear is that if you're in Canada, again, a, a form of socialized medicine, you wait forever. Whereas in America, we've been used to, especially if you are paying out of your own pocket, you have your doctors and you call your doctor and you say, I have a problem. And if you need a surgery or if you need a test, it's a relatively short time between the time you are diagnosed or the doctor believes you need the test, and you have the test. I hear in other cultures, in other societies, there's a long wait, and that people end up coming even to America because they don't want to wait. So I'm asking you, number one, to what extent is this model that I dealt with in England, does it create a problem for Israelis? What's the wait, and how do you handle this financially? So I'll start from the last question okay. because you also started with this question. Yes. How do we do it and what limitations do we have? So we spend 7.9% of our gross domestic product on health. You Americans spend between 16 and 17%. Yes, it's radically high, enormously There is high. a lot of waste here. And it's a matter of mentality. Mm -hmm. If an American physician will listen to this show yes. or observe this show, you probably will get phone calls. I understand that we are not live now. Because let's say, I'll give you an extreme example. A woman is diagnosed with breast cancer. Yes. Today. Yes. God forbid. Now, with breast cancer, today, overall, it really depends on the size of the tumor lymph nodes, but you can offer her 90% cure rate. In this country, she will call her physician. She probably will be operated on, let's say she already had a biopsy. So she will have her lumpectomy tomorrow. In Israel, she will have her lumpectomy in two and a half weeks. In England, she will have it probably in six weeks. Now, an American doctor trained in this country will tell her, this is suicide. Nobody knows when the malignant cell comes out of your lump and crosses the border. It could be tonight. It could be in two days. But in the name of good medical practice, I'm telling you, that waiting a few days to a couple of weeks will do nothing. Will do nothing. I'll give you another example. MRI. The number of MRI machines in Israel is smaller than in one corner on Park Avenue in New York. <laughs> so the question is, are we under-treating our mm -hmm. patients? Are we allowing our patients with a suspected tear of a meniscus to do surgery within weeks. Again, within weeks or a couple of months. You will do it from today to tomorrow. Without an MRI, is this a criminal act? Is this medical negligence? According to all objective sources, objective sources, 
It is not. MRI is overutilized in this country. Not every American physician will agree with me, but you spend 16% of your gross domestic product, which is much larger proportionally to the gross domestic product in Israel, on a lot of waste. Very good medicine. I'm a beneficiary of academic mm -hmm. medicine of the US, and I have Akara Satov. I'm very grateful to Yale University. I was a Fogarty Fellow. Not for nothing, the Americans are world leaders in medical research. And if you looked at the New England Journal of Medicine of 50 or 60 years ago, you would find many papers from France, from Switzerland, from Austria, not necessarily the New England, the breakthroughs in medicine. Today, the Americans dominate. So no one can question where academic medicine in America took the world to, the medications that you are getting. And we all have to be grateful for that. But in the daily clinical practice, there is a lot of unnecessary procedure, exaggerated fees. Israel is able to do it with not lesser level. I'm not talking about research, about clinical medicine, with 7.9% of the gross domestic products, because salaries of physicians are less. And reality compels you to go to the same direction. Many of American physicians today are salaried. HMOs have headquarters mm -hmm. where nurses sit and do not approve an MRI for everybody from today to tomorrow, and not even a CAT CT. So you see, as I said before, medicine became so costly that you cannot go on with this waste. And if you cut on the waste, and believe me, uh, a physician who doesn't waste is a better physician, but it's a change of mentality here. And it will take another generation or two mm -hmm. of physicians, if Obamacare catches, to understand that you can practice good clinical medicine. And even if you relate to the waiting list, yes, I think it's unacceptable, even humanly, that someone who needs a hip replacement will wait for six months and he will limp and have pain for six months. And that's the situation. Maybe in Israel it's three months. In England it will be a year, mm -hmm. a year and a half with mm -hmm. the National Health Service. I think we have to improve in that all mm -hmm. the time. But an average American physician will not tell you that it's only suffering of the patient. He will tell you, you are a criminal. You are killing your patients. But longevity in Israel is longer than in the US. And our infant mortality rate, which is the acceptable measurement of quality of medical services, is lower. It's true that America has a very wide um, uh, distribution of level of healthcare. Again, if you take New York City, probably longevity and infant mortality rate will be similar to those in Israel. But Israel also has a periphery and inequality in access to services. So all in all, I believe, and I know that I am minority, that if Obamacare will be implemented in a gradual way with really explaining what they are doing, with cutting on expenses, I think that um, the level of American clinical medicine will not be affected okay. negatively. That's Keep what I Americans believe. Do we have what to improve in Israel? Yes. yes. Yes, definitely. We have to improve. We have shortage of physicians, which is part of the reason for the long waiting list. I am ready to employ any American anesthesiologist, qualified, mm -hmm. good one, who will apply to Sharet Tzedek. Mm -hmm. And because of Obamacare, more and more American Jewish Correct. physicians are coming to yes, Israel. Yes. And many of them are very satisfied. With our relatively modest salaries, there is private medicine in Israel as well, in private hospitals, and it can be practiced. So I'm not saying we are the ideal model, but I try to give you an idea how we are able to execute it in a certain price for the patients. Okay. Again. I want to push you a little bit here on the economics again. Okay. I have a cousin who's a surgeon in America, and he makes the following argument. I want to hear what you have to say. He says to me that the problem, the real problem with medicine in America which he thinks is different in other countries. The problem from his perspective is we have a system where it's medicine for profit. And while he believes people should make a very good living, and you know, he is not anti-capitalist in the general sense, he feels that, that medicine is, again, a public service. 
and that the problem that America has, has, has grown up with, and it certainly affects, again, many Jews who go into the field of medicine, is one of the reasons why the joke is, my son the doctor, was because you made a good living. And one of the things that doctors are complaining about now in this country is that the economic incentives that once drew, once drew and drove the best and the brightest into American medicine are being lost. And that what you do want to do is you want to incentivize the best and the brightest with money. And not only will you be doing a public service, but you'll also be be able to provide for your family in a very lovely way, and you'll have nice vacations, and blah, blah, blah. I want to know your, your own personal view of the question, is, it, is a society better off or worse off if there is medicine for profit? And do you agree that part of the problem we've had is that as long as medicine is for profit, some of the waste that you describe and some of the inefficiency you describe and sometimes fragmented care. I'm afraid so. And sometimes doctors are only human beings. They may be seduced into caring more about what do they do for money than what do they do for the best health care of their patient. I want to know, therefore, to what extent is there medicine for profit in Israel? And what does Yonatan Halevi believe in general about the idea that medicine should not be for profit? Okay, so. In Israel, part of medicine today is for profit, but most of it is not. We discuss socialized medicine. And I think I can answer your rather long question with a very short answer and example. You know that there are five medical schools in Israel, and one out of 20 candidates is accepted. So we have, and I think you can make a nice living for medicine in Israel, but most Israeli physicians are salaried in the public not-for-profit system. And still the demand, you were worried, if I understood your question correctly, that there will be not enough incentive for bright and exactly good people right. to go into medicine once you become more socialized medicine in this country. So probably my standard doctor is not only the salary and not only the income, because you can see that despite severe shortage of doctors developing in the Israeli healthcare market today, still we have 20 candidates for every opening in a medical school in Israel. And, and you still today said that you're short of doctors. We are short of doctors because, again, in Israel, higher education, as opposed to this country, is again socialized. It's mainly by the government. And we have only five medical schools with 750 graduates only now, there used to be five years ago, 350. This is already the result of the shortage. I was involved in planning manpower of physicians in Israel. Same apply to nurses. Now, salaries today, after a series of strikes that were in the last three decades, are acceptable in Israel. I mean, a physician, a senior physician in Israel, in a public not-for-profit hospital, will have a salary a little bit higher than a member of parliament, a member of the Knesset, or even a minister. So you can have nice living, but you are not a rich person, mm -hmm. as opposed to many of the physicians in this mm -hmm. country. And still, even when salaries were much more modest, medical schools were the most sought-after profession in Israel. So it's not only money. I do believe, I deeply believe, that um, medicine should not be for profit. It should I don't not think be. it should not be for profit. It's not a sin to have beside, you know, along the public hospitals who do the major work. They train the residents. They prepare for emergency and for mass casualty events. They do the research. You could have minority of hospitals that are for-profit, private hospitals. Usually there is an element of cream skimming because these hospitals, and there is in every big city in Israel such a hospital, they do not have emergency rooms. They have only elective surgery. Correct. But medicine at large should be not for profit. Yes. One more question in this area, and then we move on. In America, there's a, a concern. You know, it, the, the, the way it was described during the election period here in the United States was with the phrase death panels. And 
it's a very misunderstood idea. The bottom line, however, is that, again, I'll use the British system. In the British system, at a certain point in time, the British have decided certain medical procedures are simply not, are simply not going to be available to people of a certain age. And I am now, you can tell me I'm being romantic. I have this romantic notion, picking up on something you said that I thought was so important earlier, if you can sustain a person's quality of life, and quality, meaning it's not that they're just going to be in a bed. It's not that they're going to endure in a hospital for months. They're going to get up out of that hospital bed. They're going to return to their life, and they're going to have a life they enjoy for a significant period of time. I don't care what age this person is. If that's possible for that person, I want the medical treatment. I want the medicine, I want the operation, I want the machines, I want the tests. And I don't want to hear that, that there's going to be a line drawn, a, an arbitrary line because of an age, and that after you reach that age, we just can't afford to take care of you. I want to know the same two questions. Number one, what's the practice in Israel? And what does Yonatan Halevi feel about this as a concept? And you deal with medical issues of of ethical nature, you, you deal with medical ethics in Israel, mm -hmm. and we're heading in that direction. For me, there is a medical ethical issue here. I, I want to hear what you have to say. Well, first of all, the British have a history with this, and a very bad history. I can't tell you the social, um, you know, roots of this approach, but in the 70s, they, do, they did not do dialysis to a patient over 70 years old, and there is much more rationing today, too. Israel does not have this record. I can tell you that in the dialysis unit of Sharet Tzedek, we have patients in their 90s, in the 90s. And I fully agree with your statement that wherever modern can medicine can prolong life, but life of quality, not life of degeneration, um, we have to do it. And it's not only my personal opinion. In Israel, we never ratioed care based on age, not even in admission to intensive care unit. When you read the literature, I mean, you have to use, when there is a scarce commodity, like organs for transplantation, yeah, like beds for intensive care, you have to use the utilitarian approach. The utilitarian approach says that the one who is going to benefit from this scarce commodity should be the one where the commodity or the service will contribute most to his life and to his life of quality. And that's what we have been doing in Israel. I mean, the approach to end of life is a different moral we'll issue. Talk about that you, yeah, you defined it very accurately mm -hmm. that whenever you can return a patient, regardless of his or her age, to life of quality, you are committed to do it. And I want to tell you that the whole healthcare system in Israel is geared towards it. Shari Tzedek has special emphasis on the frail segments of the population, the very young, the preemies, the very low birth weight babies, and the very old. We established the first acute geriatric department in the city of Jerusalem by a gentleman, by the way, who came from Glasgow in Scotland, Professor Arnold Rosin, that um, may he live long, he is now over 80 years old, and he founded modern geriatrics in Israel. But this was the principle. It's a Jewish principle that is emphasized, especially in Shari Tzedek, but prevails all over Israel. And we are able to do it within budget. I think there are some arbitrary rules in England. And I'm, I'm very curious, really, to research the social mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. How come that a democratic Western country are rationed against the elderly for many, many decades now and doing it till today. Do you feel it is necessary for America to ration in the same way that Britain, Britain does? Or would you hope that America, despite the percentage which is much higher of our GDP, can America adopt the Israeli model in your mind? I believe yes. I think the obstacles are political and the mindset mm -hmm. of the medical system. That's right. why I said it will take a generation or two after the Obamacare is implemented. But you can definitely endorse the Israeli model. 
And you can afford, you know, you don't have to go down from 17% of gross domestic product to 7.9. You can stabilize at 10 or 11, like Germany, like the Scandinavian countries, and give very good care. You just have to cut on the waste and on the mentality that everything has to be done from today to tomorrow. I'm not calling it rationing to postpone breast cancer surgery by a couple of weeks and to postpone hip replacement or knee replacement surgery by a couple of months. But any American physician who watches this show will say, this guy is nuts. I mean, he's torturing patients. I maintain that I'm not. I, I am on your side. You mentioned organ transplants. And one of the things I did want to ask you to comment on is my understanding, if I'm wrong, tell me, that for some reason, maybe it has to do with some Jewish mythologies, the Israeli people have not yet embraced the notion of being an organ donor the way the Jewish community here in America has, and that it is harder to get organs donated by people who have, who have had her terrible accidents and may be brain dead than it is in the United States, and that this does pose a serious problem. In my mind, it goes in some way against the Jewish tradition where, again, we do everything we can to protect and save life. But if it turns out that a person is brain dead and has organ or organs that can give life to someone who might not live otherwise, there's a Jewish mitzvah here. But I do want to hear what your sense is about the Israeli system. Yeah. Well, I know the statistics from very close because I served for six years as the chairman of the Israeli Transplant Authority, which is the equivalent of the American UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing. So every country in the world that does transplantation, a developed country, copes with a gap between supply and demand in organs. Again, I don't want to be considered by your viewers as anti-American, but in this country, where end-stage liver disease is very prevalent because of alcohol. There are around 20,000 patients waiting for a liver transplant now, and about five to 6,000 are being done a year. So the gap exists everywhere. But you are right about Israel. There is something probably, and it has nothing to do, I believe, and there was a lot of research on that, with the Jewish religion. If you take Shomer Atzahir Kibbutz, where nobody is suspected of following orthodoxy or Correct. orthodox practice, uh, the number of signatories on donor card is not low, as high as low. in Spain. It's still low. There is something you said, the word mythological. A Jew likes to get to his grave whole. And it's not a religious issue. Most of Israeli rabbis recognize brain death. There were only few of the older ones who did not recognize brain death. And yes, the gap between demand and supply in Israel is bigger than in this country and in most European countries. Um, the number of signatories on donor card in Israel is about 11% of the adult population who are eligible to sign, while the average in other Western countries is 15 to 20. In Spain, where signing a donor card make you a national hero, and that's what they did it. It's more than 30%, mm -hmm. it's true. But we are doing better. I mean, it was 10 years ago, only 4% of the Israeli population. But I do confirm your um, assumption that in a country where chesed, mm -hmm. benevolence, mm -hmm. is very prevalent. Mm -hmm. How many countries in the world have an organization like Yad Sarah? That is, you heard about Yad Sarah, they distribute to every sick patient, free of charge, any instrument that in an oxygen generator or, or a wheelchair. Israel is full with soup kitchens. It's a state of chesed. And with the ultimate chesed to donate organs, we are lagging behind. I confirm the fact, but the Knesset and the Israeli Transplant Authority and me personally do a lot in order to change the situation. Is there an educational campaign of any kind? Do you think it has to do in some way with, again, changing a culture's mentality? Exactly. There are educational campaigns, not enough because they're expensive, but in shopping malls you can see, in the army where there is always 
You know, if you ask a soldier to sign a donor card, there is always coercion around it. But there are a lot of public education in the army, in high school, everywhere. And that's my explanation, that we moved within a decade from 4 to 5 percent of the adult population signing a donor card to 11 percent. Okay, that's more than a 100 percent jump. Yeah, but we are lagging behind. We okay. are lagging behind. And, and there is no you. other way to explain. It bothers me a lot. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have, a, I have a donor card for many, many years. And I do, too. It, yeah. Well, justifiably so, I think. I mean, some people see it as an omen of long life. I mean, of a sign I don't, of a... I don't see it as any omen. I just no. see it as the right thing to do I, and the I, Jewish thing to do. I agree with you. Okay. I agree with you. Okay. But uh, it's not the Jewish way, and I believe it is something really mythological. I believe so. I agree with Jew, you. Uh, and there are few PhD dissertations were written on this subject. Why are Israelis lagging behind? And that's their conclusion. Interesting. It's okay. not a religious issue. It's a mythological issue. A related issue. Uh, talk for a moment. You know, I know I could have you here at this table and spend an hour just talking about the issues related to end-of-life care. You and I have already agreed in principle that the goal here is if there is somebody who, with treatment and medicine, etc., can then live any kind of meaningful life, we want to give it to them. There are some times, Yonatan, when a person's body has passed beyond that point. And then the care is about helping that person end life in as, and I, I don't, you may disagree with me here, I recoil at the notion of dignity as if a tube is undignified. What I want this person to do, any person, I want this person to be able to leave this world as comfortably, as painlessly as possible, and to try to help this person in as loving a possible a way as possible. In America now, the old notion of palliative care has become very important. There are hospice organizations that are doing extraordinary work, almost groundbreaking work. I want to know from your perspective, how is Israel doing with palliative care, is there the equivalent of hospice? As you have been honest enough to say, you're disappointed in the way in which Israelis have, yet, have not yet embraced organ donation. To what extent is there, from your perspective, a real honest understanding that one of the obligations of medicine is when there is nothing else one can do to prolong life for any period of time, pain management, and making the family, not only the patient, but the family, somehow part of something that is as, I want, again, I don't want to be over romantic here. It's not, nothing's beautiful about the end of life, but it doesn't have to be ugly. Do you know what I'm saying? I know okay. exactly what you're help, saying. You help see me it on here. a daily okay. basis. Okay. okay. So we are doing with palliative care much, much better than with uh, signing a donor card. Um, actually, Shari Tzedek was the first. I recruited from Sloan Kettering here in New York an Australian guy, Professor Nathan Cherney, 20 years ago, who brought modern palliative care to Israel. There were hospices before that. There are many more now. But I want to say the following. Israel is an innovator in this field, too. I don't know if you are aware of it, but for the last, since 2008, we have a law in Israel that I'm unaware of any other country in the world that has such a law. The law is called the law of the dying patient. In Hebrew, Choka Chole Anotel Lamut. Somehow it sounds better in Hebrew than in English, the law of the dying patient. It was a law conceived by a committee of 59 people who sat in Sharet Tzedek because it was chaired by Professor Abraham Steinberg, who is a pediatric neurologist at Sharet Tzedek and considered to be a world-renowned medical ethicist. And this committee um, consisted of, of physicians, nurses, social workers, rabbis, philosophers, ethicists. They were, we were divided. I was a member. I was one of the 59. We were divided into four subcommittees. And we came up with a law that passed in the Israeli Knesset with overwhelming majority, including the ultra-Orthodox parties, and it's called the law of the dying patient, which is actually a compromise between the most sacred principle of orthodoxy, sanctity of life, and the most sacred 
concept of the secular Jews and Arabs in Israel, of the secular population, autonomy of the individual. And according to this law, which still is relatively narrow, if a patient abides by two criteria, once he suffers from an incurable disease, usually disseminated cancer, we'll talk about Alzheimer affecting severely quality of life later on, we were afraid of the slippery slope with Alzheimer. But if it's an incurable disease like disseminated cancer, and if two senior physicians agree that his longevity is less than six months, a set of rules applies according to this law. First of all, any living will that this patient has will be recognized. Absolutely. Including, in, including not to connect him to life support yes. system, not to do dialysis, not even to give him antibiotics. And there is a national registry by this law of living wills of Israelis that he still do not, I mean, many don't file into mm -hmm. this registry a living but will, could. but the option is, and mm -hmm. it's widely publicized, and the number of living wills in this registry where every physician in every place in Israel, in the community or in a medical department, in a hospital is committed when his attention is um, directed by the family that the patient left a living will, he has to abide by this living will. Unfortunately, this law applies only to incurable diseases, so it does not take care of severe dementia, for instance, but it already shows you the direction mm -hmm. of Israeli society, including Israeli orthodoxy to understand that the nature of medicine today is that we were able to lead many more people to live much longer, but we did not make this progress in terms of guaranteeing their quality of life. Mm -hmm. As to palliative care in general, there are hospices now all over Israel. Palliative care is highly developed. We believe that patients should not suffer pain, mm -hmm. should not suffer, mm -hmm. definitely cancer patients, but any patient. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you one more experience I have, and then I want you to talk it in any way you want about Shari Tzedek. So you know my story. Uh, it doesn't, I don't have to give the details on, on camera, but I had a serious problem, and I was lucky beyond lucky to be brought to Shari Tzedek, and I was brought to Shari Tzedek because of the quality, specifically of the heart unit that you have there. Good for me, wonderful. It turns out, however, once I'm there, I get tremendous care, and I'm going to have another procedure, and it's going to take a few days for it. That's it. You know, I'm there just before Shabbat. There's nothing emergency now. And so I end up staying a week at Sharit Tzedek, and I get to see so much of the hospital. And one of the things that just strikes me is the extent to which I am now seeing everywhere I look, in the waiting rooms, in the halls, in the in patient rooms, there are Jewish Israelis, there are Arab Israelis. There's Arab and Jew side and by side. And, and Palestinian. Palestinians. I end up making f incredible friendships with Palestinians who are there because their mother is in the heart unit at Shari Tzedek. Not only that, I want our audience to understand. If we had more time, we would talk about the importance of nursing. I believe that nursing is a much undervalued aspect of the healthcare system. And nurses can make an enormous, they're the ones who deal with the family with and the patient. And you need great doctors, but if you don't have that supporting nursing care, something is terribly missing. I am very impressed by the nursing care I get. The best nurse I have at Jared Siddiq is an Arab, an Arab male nurse. It's something American Jews don't imagine. I don't even know if Israelis imagine it, the extent to which it exists. And he's it, the head nurse of the department. That is correct. By the way, this is a microcosm model of the best of Israel. And I now go around everywhere talking about the model of Sharet Tzedek. Not only is it an outstanding medical center, and I know it from firsthand experience, but there's a social dimension to Sharet Tzedek that shows what, in a place where it doesn't matter who you are. If you're a patient, you're the same, whether you're Israeli, Israeli Arab, Israeli Jew, or Palestinian. I thought that was just fabulous. 
And Yonatan, I've talked about Sharei Tzedek everywhere I go. I am so proud of that hospital. I have told you what I'm going to be doing with it for on Shalom TV. And I don't want to suggest that any other hospital in Israel is any different. But Sharei Tzedek, to me, is a living reality. And it's a reality of something larger. And that's what I want you to speak about as we sort of end this first meeting together. Okay. I want you to talk about the way in which Arab and Israeli and Palestinian and Jew are treated in the system and what maybe the vision could be if at some point politics caught up with just the way in which people are living together day by day in Sharet Tzedek. Talk to me about that for a moment. Okay. Well, actually, I shouldn't add anything to what you said, and I thank you for your very accurate impression, but I want to be very fair. No hospital in Israel discriminates against, you know, any segment of the population in Israel, including, of course, all minorities. So, Sharetzedek is not unique in that. We are unique that we are the only major hospital in the center of Jerusalem. Yes. And Jerusalem is a mixed city. Haifa is also a mixed city, but the Arab population compose a smaller minority in Jerusalem, where the Arabs are approaching now 40%. And living, you know, in the same area, and we are the only major hospital in the center of the city. Hadassah, and we have two campuses. Hadassah has two campuses. One is solely devoted to Arabs. So I don't want to take the credit. I believe that in general, politics should stop at the doorstep of any hospital. And I believe in general that hospital could serve as havens for peace. Because if politics stops at the doorstep of the hospital and patients from all races are united by the set fate to sustain a disease and they need help, they connect to each other. But after saying that Sharet Sadek is not unique, I would like to say very subjectively why we are unique. So it's not only that we are in the center of Jerusalem. We really emphasize a non-discriminatory approach in a way that many other hospitals don't do. And I'll give you an example, for instance. Take pediatric dialysis, pediatric nephrology, pediatric kidney diseases. In modern medicine, it's very unusual to be born with a kidney disease that necessitates dialysis when you are one or two weeks old, which is really an art form and very few can do it. Uh, by the way, these patients are not doomed at all because if they are on dialysis until they get to be 22 pounds, 10 kilograms, they can have kidney transplant. You can't have it when you are lower than that. How does this relate to the error problem? So today, I would say that 70% of patients who need dialysis during their childhood are Arabs because of the prevalence of marriage within families among the Arab population. The same applies, by the way, to the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel. So here you find a service that Sharet Tzedek developed out of its outreach towards the minorities in Israel, where 70%, and it's, it's losing money, because the reimbursement rate does not cover the expenses. And 70% of his patients are Arab children from the villages around Jerusalem. And we built a smaller unit in Augusta Victoria, which is an Arab hospital in the east part of Jerusalem. And before the Intifada, we even helped building such a unit in Gaza. So we really believe that, you know, we have the, the, the saying from our sources, Every human being is created in the image of God, so he is lovable, he is likable, beloved. and will be loved. And we will not, we will not uh, discriminate it against. But because we are in the center of Jerusalem, and because the Arab population of Jerusalem know that the same nursing care will apply to Jews and Arabs, and that we have on our staff, which applies to Hadassah too, but we have in very prominent positions, like the head nurse of the cardiology department, who would fully identify with the nurses, with the ultra-Orthodox Jewish nurses who cover the head, and they work in harmony together. 
and the Jerusalem public recognizes that. And that's our unique aspect. Do they recognize it, by the way? They recognize it. It's that. such a model, isn't it? They Yonatan? recognize. They recognize that, and I believe that we contribute to peace. We have so Absolutely. many grateful Arab patients and Jewish patients that I believe it infiltrates. In units like dialysis, where you come in and you're talking about parents who come with their children three times a week and spend four hours connected to the machine, half an hour before, an hour to rest afterwards. So it's six hours, three times a week. And you go into this unit and you see on one armchair, armchair uh, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish mother with the traditional custom talking Yiddish to her son. And on the next armchair, spending six hours together. Uh, again, an ultra-Orthodox Muslim mother with her child speaking to him in Arabic. We employ teachers who teach the Hebrew child, the, the Jewish child in Yiddish or in Hebrew, and the Arab child in Arabic. And social workers from both these, um, you know, uh, ethnic groups, Jewish and Arab, in order to take care of them. So yes, there is a family atmosphere in the hospital. I take great pride of the fact, and I'm saying it very subjectively, that although we grew within two decades from a little bit over 300 beds to 1,000 beds, we were able to maintain this family atmosphere that is more characteristics of small community hospitals. We maintain it in the huge hospital that Shari Tzedek is today, and every patient feels beloved, appreciated, and well-treated in the hospital. And again, I can say amen via amen because I was there and I know it's true. They wish we would meet only here in the studio and never, never, never in the hospital. That, that's very, very, very sweet of you. I just hope you'll, you'll make it possible for me to continue the discussion. I have a whole bunch of other issues that I would love to hear what you have to say, and I believe you are a unique voice, not in Israel, not in America, in the medical world. What you have done is extraordinary. Yashiko, Thank you very much. I enjoyed the interview. and. I'm ready to come again. Thank you okay. very, very much. You're most welcome. Thank you. Dr. Jonathan Halevi, Yo uh, Yonatan Halevi, Professor Halevi, Director General of the Shari Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem, part of the reason why Shari Tzedek is so remarkable, and you now have a sense of it because you've met him, is because of this human being here and this doctor and this Jewish guy who, who really has an incredible soul. And it is you, well, the contribution you've made will be forever, forever. And it's, it's not simply my good fortune. It's the, it's the people of Israel's good fortune. It's the Jewish people's good fortune. Kol HaKavod to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I would love to hear from you. Any thoughts or comments you have, as always, email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. And if you want to be in touch yourself with Professor Dr. Yonatan Halevi, you can email me, and I will forward your emails on to him. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.